everybody. Welcome. Um, so glad you all could join us today. My name is Linda Rapka and I am the Communications Director at Local 47 and I'll be serving as moderator for this event today. Um, so this is the Ask John Jazz Masterclass with John Clayton and I'm going to go ahead and give a little introduction to John uh, and then we'll begin. So uh, John Clayton is a natural born multitasker. The multiple roles in which he excels, composer, arranger, conductor, producer, educator, and yes, extraordinary bassist, garner him a number of challenging assignments and commissions. With a Grammy on his shelf and eight additional nominations, artists such as Diana Krall, Paul McCartney, Regina Carter, Dee Dee Bridgewater, Gladys Knight, and Queen Latifah vie for a spot on his crowded calendar. He is co-founder of the Clayton Hamilton Jazz Orchestra and the Clayton Brothers Quintet. In 1988, he joined the faculty of the University of Southern California Thornton School of Music, where he taught until 2009. Now, in addition to individual clinics, workshops, and private students, as schedule permits, John also directs the educational components associated with the Centrum Jazz Festival and the Vail Jazz Party. Career highlights include arranging the Star Spangled Banner for Whitney Houston's performance at Super Bowl 1990, whose recording went platinum, playing bass on Paul McCartney's album Kisses on the Bottom, arranging and playing bass with Yo-Yo Ma and Friends on Songs of Joy and Peace, and arranging, playing, and conducting the 2009 album Charles Aznavour with the Clayton Hamilton Jazz Orchestra, and numerous recordings with Diana Krall, the Clayton Brothers, the Clayton Hamilton Jazz Orchestra, Milt Jackson, Count Basie, McCoy Tyner, Monty Alexander, and many others. So I am so excited and pleased to welcome Mr. John Clayton. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. Good to see everybody. And good um, to be seen. As we say, good to be seen and not viewed. And two, I just wanted to let everyone know, um, if you have any questions, feel free to enter them into the chat and I will read them aloud. Um, you're also welcome to use the raise hand feature in Zoom uh, and I will call on people uh, in order that I see them here. And you are welcome to go ahead and ask your questions to Mr. John Clayton. Not that I'll have any answers. Don't get me wrong. Well, and John, all, I'll, all, I'll questions, kind of all questions are welcome except from Maurice Spears. <laughs> well, I'll start it off. I have a question for you. Um, so, you know, we're living in this extraordinarily strange time right now. Um, and I would just like to know how you are dealing with that with your work. Um, you know, are you utilizing the new technologies? Um, like how has that worked for you? Um, and also just on a personal level, I mean, if you have any tips for just kind of navigating this new realm and staying sane, um, I would love to know how you're getting <laughs> through this time. Boy, that's assuming that I'm sane, right? <laughs> um, well, I personally, I, I kind of went through, I guess, what most of the people that I know have gone through. Um, looking at your book and seeing that you have no gigs. <laughs> that was a first for me. The middle of March, suddenly everything was canceled. You know, I, I from March uh, until December and on into next year. Uh, so that was that's a new experience. I'm, I'm sure that all my musician friends have never seen a situation where there were no concerts, none. Uh, so that you know had to adjust it. So basically, personally, I went through a period of just chilling out, going, "Okay, this is the situation. Don't push it. Leave. Don't you know? No need to fret. We're all in the same boat. Leave it alone." I kind of went from that. Uh, to what I call my lazy phase. <laughs> Just I was not doing anything, but I wasn't motivated to do anything and I wasn't motivating myself. Uh, and 
that that kind of led to me really saying, okay, enough is enough. Um, let's start doing things. And and I could I could listen to recordings that I hadn't listened to before. Uh, look at at composition techniques that I really wanted to uh, read about or understand or try things like that. So you know. Right. Mm, that's that's sort of interesting, thing. kind of taking advantage of the time and using it in a positive way. Uh, I love that. That's that's really cool. Exactly. So that's and I'm still there. And of course, like, again, like a lot of people getting used to this platform, you know, we're all doing Zoom now. And that means Zoom in a lot of ways. So I do workshops, private lessons with Zoom, which I do. I'm not crazy about. Uh, nobody's crazy about it because you know if I'm if I'm with a student normally and he or she is in the same room I might say okay now um, this part of your shoulder blade and your back needs to be engaged as you move the bow this, you know simple example like that can't do that over zoom <laughs> and okay, right. things like you know how I might try to demonstrate something that I'm trying to find the right uh, well let's see how can I get uh, okay, how's the, can you see my left hand? You know, I'm going through all that uh, with the uh, with the camera in order to move forward with the lesson. So a lot of adjustments like that are made, and and of course it's music. Music is sound, and to not be able to hear the sound in the same room means I'm doing my best to give thoughts and ideas and instruction over some computer speaker. Um, and it's yeah so those are the challenges um better than nothing but um right right yeah well thank you yeah i mean that's that's great um i see a few questions coming in the chat so i'm going to yeah. go ahead and start reading them um so we have a couple of questions from ivan ivan the first one is what are your memories about playing with benny carter the king okay uh so many um uh, first of all benny carter I, I mean i have really a lot of wonderful memories and and he helped me he helped he helped me in ways that he didn't realize he was helping me i mean he for instance i uh, at some point we we're talking and he said we we're talking about arranging and i was asking him about his earlier days with writing and he said Oh, you know, well, sometimes we'd have to write big band charts and well, we, we didn't, we didn't have a score. You just had to write, write the parts out. Boom. There's the arrangement. And I went, Whoa, really? How do you do that? <laughs> so, uh, I was fascinated by that idea of writing an arrangement for a big band and not having a score going straight to the parts. Um, so, you know, whenever if you're hungry like we musicians are it's not that you just appreciate an idea or you hear music and appreciate it. you go the next step you go okay i gotta try it so anyway i ended up writing trying to write a a, a piece for the clayton hamilton jazz orchestra without a score uh and we and we recorded it it, it's, uh, it was an arrangement i did for snooki young on come sunday and for that i tried that thing that Benny Carter introduced to me idea wise of writing a piece without a score. Uh, I won't say I'll jump to do it again, <laughs> but you know, it was a, an amazing learning experience. Uh, and I remember Benny Carter, you know, he was, he was known as the gentleman of jazz, right? He was such a, uh, always smiling, always inclusive, all incredible memory, all these fantastic attributes. And uh, I remember I was in Berlin and working with the WDR big band we had a, at the jazz festival in Berlin. And um, Benny Carter was our guest. And I had, we were doing a lot, we were doing primarily his music. I had done an arrangement on his song, um, Easy Money. And Easy Money is this Benny Carter tune that goes, ba ba da ba da ba da you know, it's a nice kind of easy, medium, bouncy thing. And I thought, you know, it might be kind of cool to, to liven this up again, maybe make it a faster tempo kind of piece. So I did that. 
and there's Benny Carter in Berlin with me in the big band, and I couldn't wait because you know it came together really well. The band was playing it well, so uh, Benny walked on stage at the rehearsal, and I said, "Oh, it's wonderful to see you, Maestro Carter." And I, I um, we got a program here, and, and by the way, I did an arrangement on your Easy Money, and um, I'd like for you to hear it now. We're going to play it, so we played it. You know. One, two, you know, we play this thing through. And at the end of it, Benny Carter, in his gentlemanly way, looked up at me and he said, John, it's too fast. <laughs> so, uh, you know, but hey, we did it too fast anyway. And we continue to do it too fast with hopefully with his blessing, but um, with my apologies. Oh, that's fantastic. Thanks for sharing that, John. Um, we have a question from Matt Zebley. Uh, would you please talk about your conception of time and how to, one, develop it personally, artistically, and two, teaching it to high school and college students? Time. So one of the things that, that I try to help people understand is that nobody has bad time you know if if you're on this planet and you are you know obviously you're 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 living and you're breathing uh you have within your body a heart that that is working 24 7 and that that rhythmic pulse within your body is steady yes you may walk fast or run fast and that will increase or maybe decrease when you sleep, whatever. All those fluctuations aside, there's something in your body that's a steady pulse. All we have to do is relax and realize that that's within us and not that we're going to latch onto that timeline in exactly that tempo every time, but just so that you have this knowledge of, you know what, I have a steady pulse in my body every day, all day. Uh, then it's a question of, uh, learning how to adjust to different tempi. So if I need to play a medium tempo groove or whatever that is, I may not be able to just roll out of bed and do that with ease. I may have to actually practice that. I may have to study that. How do you do that? I usually recommend that my friends put their feet in the shoes of the masters that represent what it is that we also want to do. For instance, if I want to swing in a trio setting that plays grooves like Oscar Peterson, then I'm going to get those Oscar Peterson albums and I'm going to put them on and I'm going to just go ahead and have fun playing to those. And the cool thing about doing that with recordings is the recordings end up working at like training wheels. So the recording won't let you, drop, won't let you rush. The recording won't let you drag. You know, you have to keep adjusting so that it feels good and sounds good. Pretty soon you get to the point where you've done that enough and those things are in your blood, including when it's musically um, natural to have the tempo relax or take that extra big breath before that beat on that, that half note on beat two or whatever it is. Um, all of those things end up becoming things that, that you can't explain. You can't explain to people when you should lean on it, when you should relax it. I mean, you can, you can try, but the next thing you know, you've got a head filled with all the rules instead of really uh, having an innate understanding of how that music should feel. How do you explain this sort of thing to, to high school students? Um, I usually in a high school setting try to uh, allow my high school students to experience that. In other words, rather than me lecturing to them, talking to them, okay, guys, make sure you don't drag the tempo. Come on, let's do it. Hey, all right, hey, you guys, come on. You gotta, you gotta really lean on this. So, you know, next thing you know, you've got uh, 15, 16, 17 kids that are all individually trying to remember all of the rules that you tell them versus if you were to say, hey guys, okay, let's go ahead and, and play along with this recording. Now they have to do the internal work that's necessary to align themselves with the sounds and the grooves that they're hearing. 
some high school directors will say to me, yeah, well, I don't have that kind of time. You know what? That's going to take you less time with the students than if you try to, on a daily basis, explain to them verbally what they need to do uh, to get the music. music. Music is sound, I said. So if this is sound, and we're trying to make that sound, and this is me, it's much more direct if I go to a sound source in order to learn how to make that sound. If I instead have to look at the music, look at those black dots on a piece of paper, I have to translate that into sound. It's an extra step. If I instead immediately, immediately align myself to a sound, and you, you, you get a room full of, of kids that are playing music, you ask any of them, all of them, hey, have you guys ever played to a track, played to a groove that you like? Oh, all of their hands will go up. And they just found that little groove, found that little tune, found that little whatever, and they're just playing along with it in their, in their bedroom, having fun, right? So imagine that on a larger scale, that these students are able to do that together with some kind of recording. And that can also be the homework if it's a, if it's, if it's a, a little awkward to, to always do it in the classroom to that, at that level, that's the homework as well. So I, I usually, that's usually how I kind of work with high school students. Those are great tips. Thanks, John. Sure. Um, we have a great question here from Nicholas Fryman, who asks, John, uh, talk a bit about how you began your incredible music, musical journey. An incredible indeed. So <laughs> if you would share a little bit about, about that. Um, well, I grew up in Venice, California. Um, I didn't even have to say California, did I? If you live here, then you just say Venice. Nobody goes, <laughs> exactly. oh, you're from Italy? No, I mean, that's not gonna happen. Anyway, I grew up in Venice. I graduated from Venice High School. Um, we always heard music in, in our house because my mom played piano and organ and conducted the church choirs. And so I always had music there. And at age 13, I, I was at uh, Mark Twain Junior High School, walked into the band room and said to the, uh, the band director said to me, oh, well, what instrument would you like to play? And I looked around the band room and I saw this big thing hanging on the wall. And I said, ooh, can I play that thing over there? And he said, yes, of course. And he wrote down my name and he wrote tuba. And as I was walking out of the room, I saw these four gorgeous brown things. And I went, whoa, can I play that instead? And I always like to say he crossed off tuba and he wrote down my destiny. Uh, so I ended up I mean, I didn't, and Billy Higgins, we all knew Billy Higgins, a great drummer, used to say, you don't choose the instrument, the instrument chooses you. And that's exactly what happened to me, because I didn't know what it sounded like, but it was sort of beckoning to me. So that was really the beginning of, uh, uh, you know, touching the bass, getting to learn the bass. I went to high school, played in the high school uh, jazz band, and there my jazz band director saw I was getting serious, so he got me a classical teacher. Uh, and I started my classical lessons and soon thereafter, uh, through another high school friend, discovered an Oscar Peterson record with Ray Brown on bass and Ed Thigpen on drums. And I heard that track, they're playing Billy Boy, changed my life. I said, whoa, I'd never heard the bass played like that. So uh, 16 years old and I, I went to my next classical lesson. I said, have you ever heard of Ray Brown? And he said, oh, yeah, sure, he's a friend of mine. And he took out a letter that said, Dear Mr. Siegel, would you please tell your students about a class I'm teaching at UCLA called Workshop in Jazz Bass? That was my last classical lesson with that guy. I saved $65, and I enrolled in this class extension course that Ray Brown taught. And there, Ray Brown not only went over all of the you know, basics, but... He introduced, I'd never heard these people before. He played records of Richard Davis, uh, Ron Carter, Milt Hinton, Scott LaFerro, um, the list, George DeVivier, Sam Jones, um, on and on and on. And so we heard all these recordings, we got all these, this guidance from Ray Brown, and he saw that I was this hungry teenage kid and he, after the course ended, he allowed me to follow him around and um, 
I actually, people say, oh, you study with Ray Brown. True, but I actually more than study with him, I studied him. And I studied how he played in his music. He never told me to do that, but I was just in love with what he did. So I got all the recordings I could find. I tried to play as much as I could. I didn't, I wasn't at the level I could do everything, but I did as much as I could. And um, so he became, you know, kind of a second father to me, major mentor. And uh, through him, more and more doors opened for me. He saw that I was really, he got me a classical teacher again. I was also playing electric bass at the time. He got me lessons with Carol Kay. Uh, he made sure that he, along with my classical teacher, saw that I was doing too many gigs in LA. And, they, and my classical teacher said, I talked to Ray Brown and we feel that you need to get the hell out of here and learn how to play the bass. Uh, so they shipped me off to Indiana University and uh, I finished school there. And um, that's where I met Jeff Hamilton. He and I became best friends. Uh, I just before going to Indiana met Monty Alexander and heard him. And even though it was my dream to play with Oscar Peterson, after hearing Monty Alexander, I said, Ooh, I want to play with that guy. So, um, I finished in Indiana university and actually I, I didn't graduate initially. I, um, but I, cause I failed music history, but I said, okay, five years of school is enough. I'm out of here. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I went on the road with Monty Alexander and Jeff Hamilton. Um, at the end of that, toward the end of that two years, I did go back for a summer session in Indiana to take, I took the music history class that I failed and passed. And I also took bass lessons that summer with a guy from Russia named Eugene Levinson, who became there soon after that, the principal bass of the New York Philharmonic. He changed my life in terms of solo bass playing uh, with this, his whole beautiful Russian romantic school. Um, so I learned a lot from him. And then I went on the road after those couple of years of my Alexander with Count Basie. And that's where I, I got bit by the arranging writing bug. Um, even though I'd never taken a comp composition and arranging lessons, I just jumped into the pool and the guys were so so supportive you know they would they would get come to the gig early and play 16 bars uh, that i may have written for a brass thing so that they could check that out i see ray brown uh great trumpet player is, is with us today hey, ray and i know he was on the band helping me out they would do things like if i want, wanted to hear what a saxophone solely sounded like I'd write eight bars and the whole sax section would come to my hotel room just to play those eight bars. I mean, that, that's the kind of support and familial vibe that I learned, uh, not only from Ray Brown and all the you know, musicians, musicians in LA, but further with, anyway, I left Cal Basie after two years and went, moved to Holland to be with my then girlfriend, now wife, who's Dutch. And I played, uh, jazz gigs and wrote a lot, but I also my primary uh, job was uh, playing principal with the Amsterdam Philharmonic um, for five years. Then moved, uh, we had two children, so with the two youngsters in tow, moved to Los Angeles uh, and um, started, I, I did a lot of studio work, uh, was going to start um, I actually studied writing for film, I was going to do that. And, uh, I had a lot of support from, you know, people like Benny Carter, Henry Mancini, um, Johnny Mandel, Quincy Jones, um, Jack Elliott, they were all willing to help me. And then I realized, cause one of the motivations for first, the motivation was the music and the challenge. Then the motivation became. Um, me noticing that when I, as a player, I'd be in these big LA sessions with huge orchestras, whether it was for John Williams or Jerry Goldsmith or you name it. And I'd look around and I, it would be like a 60, 70, 75 piece orchestra. And I might be the only black person in the whole orchestra. And, um, I thought this is wrong. This is, this is Los Angeles. This isn't even, you know, Idaho or Iowa or someplace where we don't have 
these this kind of um, collection of musicians that are diverse. This does not represent what LA is like. It doesn't represent what LA musicians goals are. So I thought, well, you know what, I'll just, I'll get in here and I'll start hopefully getting in the film world as a writer and I'll do my best to change what I can and, and just integrate studio work even more. And then I always like to say that jazz saved my life because that's the wrong reason to do music. You don't want to do music to affect a social change. You want to do music to express yourself artistically. If you can also, along with that, affect a social change or whatever kind of changes or, you know, things that you would like to, to help along the way, great. But that must not be the primary motive for doing music. It's like people who get in music to, to make money, you know, first of all, they must be out of their minds. <laughs> Secondly, uh, you know, if, if they are blessed to be able to do it for that reason, frankly, I don't want to hear that person's music. I always say, I'm the devil. I want your soul. <laughs> you know, I want to hear your heart expressed through the music that you do. So anyway, that's a little bit of my background. Thank you, and that's that's a that's a wonderful thing to remember to have that, you know, it has to come from a good place in the heart, right? And that's that's really how you affect change anyway, from a place of purity. So that's beautiful. Um, we have another question here from Julio Figueroa. Um, could you please talk about the many incredible drummers you've had the opportunity to play music with, and what made them special? Hmm. Wow. Um, yeah, you know, I am so lucky, <laughs> so blessed to have been able to work with it. Uh, a long list of amazing drummers. Uh, Jeff Hamilton, obviously, he and I remain best friends and, you know, Clayton Hamilton Jazz Orchestra. We, but, you know, even when we were at college together, um, we actually worked on our connection, on our musical connection. We experimented together, tried different things. Even with Monty Alexander, we talked about, you know, just focusing on each other and not on yourself and all that stuff. So, you know, he's one, he's, he's old shoes. I can play with him and not think about it. Um, also, Billy Higgins was like that. I didn't have to think. I could not play with Billy Higgins for months and then pick up the bass and in two bars, it was just, I didn't have to think about it. Um, also, um, uh, gosh, but you know, that aside, other people that I've worked with, cause, you know, Lewis Nash is another one that it just automatically happens. But even the people that it may take two or three bars to finally find our, our, our marriage level, <laughs> um, even they are so inspiring to play with, whether it's, uh, you know, the problem with starting to name names is you leave out a whole lot of people. <laughs> but, you know, if, if, if I'm playing with a Roy McCurdy uh, or with a, a um, with a an Obed Calvert, more a younger kind of drummer, or let's see, I played with Louis Belson, played with Buddy Rich. Uh, I uh, got to hear, but didn't play with Art Blakey and Elvin Jones, and uh, you know, a long list of those kinds of people too. Um, but yeah, it's 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 really a long list of people. A lot of names that you wouldn't know um, from Europe, for instance instance. Um, so yeah, I, I, I will just sum it up to say that, that that's such a long list that I'm kind of snow blind in terms of the names. They're not really surfacing, but I, the drum and bass hookup is the most important hookup of pretty much of any band that I can think of. Uh, if you're talking about swinging, the drums and the bass are the only two instruments that have to play every quarter note together. And if that ain't happening, 
for giving all the home. Very, very true. Thanks, John. Uh, we have a question here from Vicki Riggs. Um, she says, while I believe classical and jazz technique is the foundation of all Western music, could you suggest any additional technique or practice tips for playing pop, rock, funk, or blues music? <clears throat> Excuse me, sure. It's, to me, it's really about, it starts with environment. So, yeah, I'm sure we've all heard the classical person that thrusts in, is thrust into a jazz environment and they try to play a jazz solo and, you know, they do their best and it's kind of like, uh, okay, you know, and vice versa, you know, the jazz person who's trying to play a classical piece and they start playing and, and you know, they do their best, but it's uh, not quite. And what does that represent? That, that doesn't represent a lack of desire or, or, or nerve to try it. It really represents to me um, a need to envelop yourself in that environment. So a person who listens, who plays a lot of jazz, they wake up in the morning, they're probably gonna turn on the jazz station. They get in the car, they're gonna pop in a jazz CD. They go to a, a concert at night, they're probably gonna go to a jazz gig, you know? And the other way around, a classical person, they're gonna do the same thing, listen to it at home, listen to classical music in the car, they go to a classical concert or concerts, you know? So pretty much morning, moon, noon, and, and night, that person, those people are focused on whatever music is really exciting them. You can't just roll out of bed and suddenly embrace this other thing. You have to do the same thing environment-wise that allowed you to grow in this area. So if somebody wants, if a jazz person wants to learn how to play a classical piece or pieces, then they have to do the same thing that they did with jazz. They've got to just enmesh themselves in that sound, go to those concerts, start understanding that talk and those mannerisms and that, all that stuff and the other way around. So all, I just use those two examples, but it's true for any kind of music that you want to play. If I had to play bluegrass right now, I might squeak by. <laughs> but if I really wanted to get down with bluegrass, that means I got to do that bluegrass homework, just like I did the jazz and the classical homework. Um, so I think that it's, it's really about looking at yourself and going, okay, do I love this enough? Am I inspired by this enough to really dive into it in a big way? And not just enough to like get the job done. Because if you think about it, the things that we do best and that we do well, I, I don't consider that we have learned how to do that. I think that represents a kind of overlearning it. So much so that you don't have to think about it. You know, if you're a jazz player and I say, hey, let's play blues and F, you don't have to think about that. <laughs> you know, if you're a classical player and I say, hey, let's play uh, this A2 or let's play a, uh, a three octave scale up and down with this articulation. It's no problem, you know, but it takes really really committing yourself to it that way and i think that's true for for any kind of music right yeah you got to do your homework mm -hmm. very true we have another question here um from emiliano Villarreal. Um, when developing your walking lines do you think it's more important to start transcribing from your favorite bassists and really internalizing the way they approach it or have isolated concepts or ideas separate from that uh, possibly having a combination both ways in your studies? Uh, usually when a student asks me that kind of question, I say yes. <laughs> because they're going to go, uh, well, which one? I'll say yes. Anything that's going to keep the instrument in your hands. Sometimes you'll run into people that say, oh, I just want to get better. And I'm like, hey, hey, you're getting better. If you're playing your instrument, you're getting better. <laughs> so keep the instrument in your hands. Now, if you ask me, like some people say, <clears throat> do you think I should learn, <clears throat> um, learn a tune in 12 keys? And I will answer yes. If they ask me if I would learn a tune in 12 keys, I'll tell them no. <laughs> and uh, I, personally, I would rather learn 12 tunes than one tune in 12 keys. 
So that's me. That doesn't mean you have to do it my way. Whatever is going to keep the instrument in your hands and, and allow you to grow in the ways that feel good to you. Um, in terms of, of learning, so all, all that to say, in terms of learning bass lines, um, I, I do think that the transcribing, transcribing thing is important. But also along with that, in trans, by transcribing, uh, I, I, I have a broader depth definition of the term transcribing. I think of it as um, uh, absorbing, in this case, the sounds from a source, right? And learning those sounds. That's kind of transcribing. So in other words, it doesn't have to mean that you write it down. In fact, if you do write it down, uh, you probably will end up turning it into a reading exercise. Um, can I pause one second? Uh, because I just realized that I didn't plug in my laptop and, and this, it's going to die in like <laughs> two minutes. Give, Absolutely. Give me 30, 30 seconds. Tell a joke, will you, Linda? Oh, yeah. Put me on the spot. So I just wanted to remind everybody um, who may have joined a little bit after uh, the start of the meeting. Um, you're welcome to ask questions here. Um, you can type them into the chat here and down. Um, if you would prefer to ask a question uh, on video, you can do so. And if you would just please use the raise hand feature in Zoom, and I'll go ahead and uh, call on you when the time is right there. So, all right, welcome back, John. Y'all, y'all powered up now. <laughs> I'm all, I'm good to go. I'm all plugged in. Uh, but just to finish that, uh, the question really briefly. Um, so I usually recommend that people transcribe, but they also try to find a balance. So it's in my, for bass players, I think it's okay to write out bass lines that you're transcribing because so often if it's a swing kind of groove, it's going to be quarter note after quarter note. Yes, you can memorize that. However, you know, after eight or 10 courses, that might be kind of, a big, a big mouthful. So it's okay to write out bass lines, but we're not allowed to write out bass solos or any solos because solos are constructed in phrases and it's much less work to memorize phrases. And also that helps you then balance out the reading part along with the oral and memorization part. So I, th I think a combination of what um, was asked is, was, is my thing. Uh, frankly, whatever is really exciting to you, you know, I, I don't think that we should approach our instrument with, okay, God, well, this is really good for me. Here I go. You know, next thing you know, you're hating it. I think that, that obviously we're going to do some things that we like more than other things, but if we can find a way to, to always keep it interesting, frankly, if you're practicing something that you suddenly are just not into you're not going to be learning anything you know it, it's just so that's the time you shift to something else on your menu and go okay let me just play some courses of this or whatever it is or this other piece that i really like playing then go back to that other thing and it's going to feel a lot fresher it, it's always about keeping things fresh to me and fun i always tell my students i have a new four letter F-bomb. It's F-U-N-N. -N. <laughs> it always has to be fun. <laughs> I love that. That's, that's a great tip, John. Um, we have a question here from Daniel McCain. Do you have any exercises or warm-ups that you can share? Uh, <clears throat> let's see. I, you know what? The, I kind of make them up as I go along. Um, I, it, for, in my opinion, it depends on the... Um, on the age and the um, length of time the, in this case, bass player has played. So if it's a young person, they're gonna be developing muscles. They need to have that instrument in their hands for a, a certain period of time, hopefully on a daily basis or six days a week and take a day off kind of thing. Uh, so for that kind of a, a student, I, I really, I, I might have them doing some um, individual fingering kind of exercises. So 
on an open string playing open one, two, four, and then back to two, back to one, open, and just kind of doing that um, so that they can really understand the distance that they need to have between their fingers in order to play, right? And then um, also they're understanding how to use their fingers, how to push down the strings, how much strength is necessary to uh, get the tone, blah, 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 all those kinds of things. So for that kind of student, I'm, for somebody else, I might say, you know, if you want to warm up, I would say uh, pick your pick a, 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 a small collection of scales. You don't have to, maybe you don't have to play all 12 scales, but do three or whatever feels good to you in two and three octaves slowly so that you really are controlling and understanding the shifts involved and all. That's an amazing warm up because every time you play bass, not usually, sometimes, often, no. Every time you play bass, you're playing scales. Whether it's a blues line or any kind of walking line, it's scales. So if scales are kicking you in the butt, we gotta do scales. And I think we all have to be honest with ourselves and go, okay, all right, Clayton, you know that F sharp scale in three octaves is a challenge for you. Come on, you know, we have to be honest with ourselves. And, and then I have to really isolate the problem intervals and shifts and all that. So that, that's a lot of work that we can figure out on our own. And that works as a wonderful warm up for me. The other warm up that I kind of do might be playing all of the um, chord types in every key. Uh, like if I, if I take triads, for instance, I might go, I might grab the bass and just to warm up, play all of my triads. So I'm going, So that might be a, a kind of a warm warm up that gets my gets my hands moving, but also gets my ears in a kind of mode of uh, of whatever chord type it is. And I'm, I'll do that with all different kinds of chord types uh, and in composition as well. So that's kind of those are some of the warm ups. But again, it has to be uh, if I find. I always tell, remind my students personally, I'm never bored <laughs> uh, because if I'm playing long tones and really slow scales and stuff, then I, I'm thinking about different things. I'm thinking about keeping my bow parallel to the bridge. I'm thinking about keeping the same amount of weight in the string from the frog to the tip. I'm thinking about keeping my uh, hand position so that it's, so I've got such a long list of things that keep me engaged that even if I'm doing a quote warm up, it's never boring. It's never just a warm up. So. All right. Thanks, John. Sure. Um, so Betsy Stern says, you have a gorgeous, gentle approach to the bass. Can you talk <laughs> a little bit about approaching such a large instrument with such a deep and broad range of dynamics? Whew. Um, thank you. <laughs> I, um, you know, I think most of what we do uh, reflects um, emulating things that inspire, that really, that feel good to us, that are, that we're curious about, that are really exciting for us, stimulating, inspiring, you know, so I, we, everybody here can think about um, heroes they have and the more we do music, the more heroes we encounter, uh, living and dead. So we'll listen to those recordings and go, oh my God, it's such a beautiful song. Oh, I love that. Next thing you know, we're learning that melody. Um, you hear somebody playing a killing bass line and you go, ooh, God, I, I want to do that too. Next thing you know, you're, you're learning that killing bass line. So I, I really think that that that's it. I mean, I, all the things that I, I represent, um, someone will look at, at us, look at you, look at me, and they're going to see 
us who we are. They're gonna, and they're, they're going to recognize us for who we are. But if somebody's really interested in who we are, they don't look at our parents. They look at our grandparents to really understand why our hair is the color it is, why our eyes are shaped the way they are, et cetera, et cetera. And it's the same thing with music. I, if, if somebody looks at me, they're going to hear me. But if they really want to understand where I come from, then they will have to uh, understand all of my influence. Ray Brown, we were talking about him earlier, the bass player. If, Ray, if I hear Ray Brown play after three notes, I know it's Ray Brown. If I analyze Ray Brown, I can hear the direct influences of Oscar Pettiford, Jimmy Blanton, Slam Stewart, for instance. And it's that way with everybody. So that, that's kind of, kind of how that goes. <laughs> Thank you, John. All right, we have a question here. Um, what influences do you use when writing for your smaller group, the Clayton Brothers? Hmm. Um, I use a variety of influences, but to tell you the truth, more than influences, I am inspired by the people in the band. And I learned that from so many of the masters, I learned, don't write for the instrument, write for the person. So when I'm writing for the Clayton brothers, I don't write for an alto saxophone, I don't write for a trumpet, I don't write for piano. I write for my brother, Jeff. I write for Terrell Stafford on trumpet. I write for Gerald, because I know when Gerald touches the piano, he's, he can get this sound. Or Jeff, my brother, has a tendency to play this kind of style or this way or scoop this note or whatever. And, and then um, when we come together, uh, number one, it never sounds like what I imagine it will sound like. <laughs> never, not one time. Because, you know, these human beings have to look at those black dots on a piece of paper and get in my soul, understand what it is I was trying to, and inevitably, also with the CHJL, with the big band, uh, I'll pass out a piece of music and the guys will play it. And I'm thinking, wow, that sounds terrible. <laughs> but then, then the hands start going up. You know, John, at letter C, you got this, that, did you want me to play that this way? And, and next thing you know, everybody's contributing all these ideas. I'm going, yeah, well, yeah, now it's starting to, to take shape. I just needed to, to have the people that are playing the music put their, their thumbprint on it, put their stamp on it. So it's that way with the Clayton Brothers too. Um, I have ideas, I have fantasies. I'll write it for those people. And um, that's not to say that I don't get inspiration from other things. You know, I might listen to some Horace Silver or Cannonball or you know, a lot of people, frankly. But um, ultimately, it's always about writing for the people, not for the instruments. I love that. And I love how music kind of takes on a life of its own. Even mm -hmm. if you have something kind of in your head, it becomes this whole other thing. That's, that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, we have a question here from Taylor Hatch. John, what's the biggest piece of advice you've got from anyone in your career? Ray Brown. <laughs> I was following him around uh, when I was a teenager and he let me come to jazz clubs he was playing at locally. He let me um, go to studio sessions and watch him record and all that. And, and I was so in love with the whole scene. I, you know, I'd look around, there's, there's in the studio, there's Quincy Jones over there and there's Maurice Spears over there. And there's, there's Jerome Richardson over there and there's Snooky Young and there's Sweets Edison and there's, you know, and then I saw this big case that the bass went in that said it had Ray Brown's name stenciled on it, you know. And then I saw a thing called, it, had, it was like a, a bass amplifier and it had Ray Brown, amplifier two, which implies that there's an amplifier one. It might even be an amplifier three, you know. I was just falling in love with all this stuff and all these people. So I said to Ray Brown, I said, you know, when I finish school, do you think you can help me get into studio work. 
and he exploded. He said, what? You don't even know how to play the effing bass. What are you talking about? First thing you need to do is you need to learn how to play the bass from here to here, and then get your ass out there and make some music. And if you want to come back here and play this BS, it'll still be here. I mean, I was like, <laughs> he had never talked to me like that. <laughs> and we laughed about it later, years later. I said, do you remember when you exploded it? He said, you're damn right I remember. I was afraid you are going to be a studio musician. <laughs> so, um, and nothing wrong with being a studio musician if that's what you want to be. But he saw that I was, I, I had my priorities all upside down. So, the, so basically, the best advice that I got was learn how to play. Learn how to play. And we all know people who put the blame on other stuff. Oh, you know, the work's just dried up. Well, things ain't like what they used to be. I remember back when, blah, blah, blah. You know what? <laughs> That's on you. That's like, like you know, I, I see so many, we've seen it gazillions of time, you know, people be studying, working on their music. And the whole time they're, they're learning and they're growing. Well, at some point, the phone starts to ring, you start working, music continues to do this. At some point, the phone stops ringing and you go, whoa, things really suck now. How come I'm not working anymore? Well, frankly, you're here and the music is here. If you want to be a part of the music, then it's, a, it's a, up to us to all look in the mirror and go, okay, John, you know, you know that you got through that tune, but you don't really know the chord changes. You know you were rushing the tempo. You know you were dragging the tempo. You know you don't know that style. Whatever it is, we all have to be honest with ourselves and look in our mirror. And then if we want to be a part of that music, then we do all the homework that we were doing before, right? Do all the homework that's necessary to go ahead and embrace that. It's, it's, it's just too easy to put the blame on. What's it they say? Um, you point the finger at somebody else, you're pointing three at yourself. Right, it kind of, it boils down to that. It's, it's, it's always on me. It's always on us individually. That's really, really great advice. Thanks, John. Sure. You always gotta keep learning, right? Totally. You gotta keep working. Totally. We have a question here. Um, could you please tell us what is the connection between practicing classical and jazz double bass? Uh, it's interesting because it's only music, <laughs> so that there, there are so many common denominators. There, first of all, they're both just music. It's it's only a style. It's only um, a vocabulary that needs to be learned. It it kind of boils. I'm not trying to simplify it, but at its core, that's really what it is. So, so the, um, if you're in love with whatever it is, if you're in love with jazz, then, and you're in love with classical music, then you end up representing when you perform, when you express yourself, you end up representing the love that you have for that music, for that sound. In embracing, I'm just gonna pick those two worlds right now, classical and jazz. In embracing those two worlds, you then start to feel, even more than understand, feel the common denominators. So when I'm playing a classical piece, uh, if I'm playing a symphony, then I might in the bass section be arpeggiating in some Beethoven symphony, um, C, E, G, B flat, D, right? In my mind, I'm going, oh, that's a C9 chord. It's probably going to resolve to an F. Boom, there it does. You know, that's thanks to my jazz upbringing, you know, that I can look and, and hear these chord changes and, and harmonic movement. On the other side of the thing, I might have some really intricate or kick me in the butt bebop melody. Well, thanks to all of those studies and etudes that I did in the classical world, I have now another fingering that I can use that makes it a lot easier to play that bebop melody. So 
two small examples, but the more you do, the more you pursue both, the more you kind of discover what the common denominators are for you. And, um, and that's kind of cool. That's, 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 it's hard to really list what those are, but um, they're there and, and you find them on your own. Thanks, John. Sure. We have a question here from Taylor Hatch. What has challenged you the most when it comes to practicing during the pandemic? Have you been challenged to fight any ruts in your practicing? Sure. I think the new schedule of the pandemic um, <clears throat> has made me also come up with a new schedule that includes music, that includes practicing. <clears throat> and that's, that's obviously individual for everybody. Because we musicians are motivated by the event. If, if we know that we have a gig that requires that we learn whatever it is, then we go, okay, the gig is happening in two weeks. Here I go. And we start practicing. In absence of that carrot, that motivation is on us. And, you know, it always is on us for a part. But now, it, in a lot of cases, is wholly on us. And that's challenging. So I rem whenever I think about that and I feel I need the motivation, then I'm, I help motivate myself by getting out of my world, getting off my own island. People give energy. And rather than rely on my energy for motivation, I attach myself to other people's energy. So I will call some of my friends and get them to, to um, help me think of a project that we can do. You know, for instance, Wednesday, I'm playing with Tamir Handelman. You know, that, that's, that means that I'm working all, all of his kick me in the butt music right now, or else I'm not going to have it together when I do the gig on Wednesday. Now, it's just one example, but the more of those things, you know, picking up on his energy and other people's fantasies and ideas that involve me really keep me, keep me going. So I would say when you can't, when it's a challenge to motivate yourself, then rely on other people to help you commit to something and that your, your fantasies can go wild with that, whether it's playing together separately masking up and getting together you know whatever um there are gazillions of ways you can but it's it's it is a challenge because we're not used to this <laughs> right very very true and by the way I just saw jeff clayton joined on so hey jeff oh nice <laughs> my oh, mother's <yeah>. son <laughs> So we have a, a question here from Barry Cobert. John, will you talk about the different feeling you get when playing a piece like the Hollywood, excuse me, playing a place like the Hollywood Bowl for thousands of people compared to just a few people at a place like uh, the Loa or a small club? <laughs> wow, hello, Barry Cobert. That's one of my former guys who I'm proud of doing so well. Um, <clears throat> you know, you, you, I think that you make the automatic adjustments. Uh, you learn things when you're in those different environments. If I'm playing, if whenever, if we are playing in a club, um, as musicians, you find that you don't have to push as hard. It's like I, I will often tell students, how many of you played in a marching band? You know, all their hands go up, and I say, well you know what it's like. One of the frustrating things about playing in a marching band is that if you are a horn player, your sound never comes back to you. And as a result, if you're not careful, you overblow. You try to play harder because you're trying to fulfill this need to hear and feel your sound. Um, if you are in a, a small club, if, if you've ever been to, you know, a small club, uh, if you remember Shelley's manhole, or if you've 
the old Catalinas, the, you know, the new Catalinas is much more, much larger. But if you've been to a small club, Vitello's, whatever, you, you know, as a player, you don't have to push as hard because the walls are closer. Your sound comes back to you with much more immediacy. And that feels more comfortable to us. So if I'm playing in a large venue, the thing I have to remind myself of uh, is it's important just to focus on getting this music to sound good and comfortable on the stage. Forget about the rest of it. So if I'm playing at the bowl, I don't think about how big the bowl is. I only think about let's work on getting the sound good here and then allow the sound engineers to project it however they're going to project it. Notice, notice I didn't say screw it up however they're going to screw it up. Uh, <laughs> that's, those are the sound engineers who still have a lot to learn. But it's the same thing in a small club. If I'm playing in a smaller club, then I, I realize, oh, I don't have to push as hard. If you're a horn player, if you're any kind of player, you really appreciate playing in a smaller venue because you don't have to force your fortes and you can play pianissimo and it'll sound and feel really good. So yeah, it's mainly about getting it to sound good on the stage and not thinking about the rest of the hall. Well, thanks, John. Um, we have a question here entered from Jan Cherry, who says it's actually, uh, she's relaying, relaying a question from Maurice Spears. Uh -huh. From an arranger's point of view, what is the role of the trombone section in a big band? Uh, I think of the trombone, first of all, it's multifaceted. I think that, <clears throat> that each section needs to have the freedom based on the composer arranger, the freedom to, to not only fulfill the roles, the traditional roles. But trombones are the, in my opinion, trombones are the glue to the band in terms of the horn presentation. So the, the, the ear always goes to the top instrument of every section. The ear will always go to the first alto saxophone, to the first lead trumpet, to the lead trombone. And <clears throat> uh, understanding that as a writer, you then get to um, combine the various sections, understanding that the ear, ear is always going to go to the lead player in each one of those sections. So in the trombone section, I'll always use the trombone section, understanding what the lead player is doing. I will use the entire section to hold together the harmonic um, um, strengths necessary in the entire horn presentation. If you're a piano player, I think of the trombones as the left hand. You know, so you're playing with your right hand, you might be soloing, but the left hand is going to be supporting what's going on here. If you're going to play two fisted chords, then the left hand is going to represent the warmth, the meat, the, the necessary, the third and the seventh, etc. You know, so the right hand, and this is all rules are made to be broken. So this is traditionally speaking. Uh, I'm going to have my trombones represent that left hand and I'm going to have the right hand represent maybe the upper extensions. In most cases, the melody, whether it's the trumpets or the saxes. So yeah, I kind of, I also appreciate that the trombones can work uh, beautifully with the trumpets and or work beautifully with the saxophones. So there's a kind of an overlap. Uh, if this might be, say, the sax range, whatever that means, then the trombones can fit right in there and even go lower uh, or sometimes climb up. Anyway, so it's a very flexible, um, a very flexible tool, the trombone section for me, I think for most writers. Thanks, John. 
Uh, Vicki Riggs wrote in, this question is from my mom, the coolest 92 year old pianist. <laughs> And uh, the question is, I'm not having trouble arranging pieces, but how do I connect them? How do I play a nice introduction for each piece in a series of pieces? So say that again, because I'm trying to understand uh, play, meaning play for an introduction on the piano. Uh, so the question you... was, sure. So she asks, I'm not having trouble arranging pieces, but how do I connect them? How do I play a nice introduction for each, each piece in a series of pieces? Okay. I think the, the quick answer for me would be, think about the mood of the piece that you're going to play and then represent that mood in whatever creative way you're gonna do it. So if, if you're going to go to an up-tempo, exciting kind of piece, then your intro might be up-tempo and exciting. And then, then it leads to, because it's an introduction. It's basically in a musical way, trying to go ba -da 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 -da, boom, you know, right there it is. Whether that's a ballad, whether it's something romantic, whether it's really slow and mellow and introverted, you know, whatever. Um, so I, I'd like to think about the mood and then let the introduction uh, represent the mood. That's my knee jerk. You can also do the opposite. You can set up a mood that's contrary to the song that you're going to play. So you might play something, you know, really chill and really mellow. And then suddenly there's a one second pause and you go, ba -da, ba -da, da -da, da -da, you know, and then you, you, you provide contrast that way. Um, Contrast is a big thing for, for us musicians, and tension and release is also a big thing. But I would say knee jerk is create the mood that you're going to represent in the tune you're going to play. The last part is uh, when you're really lost, when you're really in doubt, then find an example of the thing that you are trying to do. So go to that recording that represents that kind of an intro that you also want to do. It doesn't mean that you'll steal it directly, but you'll have a much better idea of how you can approach that. So, and you might steal it. Hey, that's cool too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. Uh, Leslie Baker asks, are those drawers behind you all full of music? <laughs> Hi, Leslie. Uh, yes, they are only, and they're all, they're, they're all CD, uh, drawers on You know, I, this is my little music space. And when I had it built, uh, I told the, the guy who, who made these cabinets, he said, I want, I want only room for CDs. I, I don't want wasted space, you know? And so he did, he just made all these drawers and, but now um I, I i've filled them all so <laughs> so now I'm, I'm i'm in the middle of the process this is also part of my covid adventure i'm taking all of the plastic cases out and i take the jewel boxes and i'm taking out the cd and the booklet and i'm putting them in um in in um see-through plastic covers so i eliminate about I'm, I'm actually creating about 70% more room by eliminating all the jewel cases. It's a long process and uh, it's one I just, I don't do it every day, but that's, that's my, one of my projects. And then eventually so, I'm going to turn many those How is that, John? Lord, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thousands. <laughs> but <clears throat> eventually I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, convert those into places to store uh, music because you don't want to see the rest of my room it's it's just there are too many stacks of music and I'm so I'm filing I usually I've, I've got a, another room that I file all my scores in and um, I've outgrown it so <clears throat> I'm trying to create room there to continue and basically when I write a score I've got a database 
and I will just give that new score a number, enter it in the database, and file it away by number. And if I ever need to, you know, grab that score, I just go on, open up the database, and do a sort or a search by title or whatever, and then I know where to find it. So wow. that's, the way, that's the way I do it. But I'm running out of room, so I got to create room back here. And CDs, nobody, CDs are they're obsolete now. <laughs> you, I mean, you, you can't play a CD in your car. There's no more CD slots on your computer. You know, they're, they're, they're not doing that anymore. So <laughs> I, 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 I switched to those plastic covers a while back, John, and it does save you a, a whole lot of room. Yes. I did that and put them all in alphabetical. I thought those were scores in there. It looks like a perfect spot to put scores. And they, no, actually, I'm, I gotta see if it's gonna work with scores, frankly. I've got dividers in them that let me have three rows of CDs. And um, I don't yet know if all of my scores will fit in them. So uh, that's, that's an experiment. Cause I have to take out the dividers and you, this TMI, you don't wanna know all this stuff. <laughs> it's COVID time. Time to do that. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Thanks, Leslie and John. Um, you, Leslie. So we, we have a question here from Taylor Hatch. Uh, you've played with many guitarists over the years. What have you learned from trying to play slash keep the time for them? Uh, well, first of all, <clears throat> I don't keep the time for them. I keep the time with them. Um, even if it is a, even if it's not Freddie Green style, <clears throat> excuse me, but, but um, and that's important. I'm not, I'm not trying to correct you. I just want to point out that that's really crucial for me. You know, I, I really have to play time with people. Uh, if they need me, if they kind of have an oopsie, then I want to be there for them with whatever solid time. Um, but I really, I think that the thing that helps me play with anybody, but we'll talk about guitars right now, is when I'm playing with them, not to listen to myself. Don't focus on myself. Every time I focus on myself, I'm frustrated. You know, I, I, I do the self-critical thing. I, I, I judge what I'm doing. I'm, it doesn't sound great to me. I'm like, oh, God, not again. Don't change have any other ideas Clayton you know I just go through what everybody goes through but every time I listen to my friends I'm always knocked out with what they did I'm always going yeah cool oh yeah killing you know I, I love what they do so you know we discover when we focus on ourselves we're less satisfied when we focus on others we're always satisfied therefore I never focus on myself in doing so it could be that that guitar player that I'm playing with will come up with a, a, a different line or a different chord that requires a different bass note from me. And that'll happen only because I'm really focused on that other musician. So that's kind of how that works, not only with, with harmonic things, but also with the groove of time. Cool, thanks, John. Uh, sure. We've got another question here. Um, how much has Thad Jones's writing influenced your arranging, especially in saxophone voicing? <laughs> I'm busted. <laughs> they discovered me. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I have, I have, I have been devouring Thad Jones since since my teenage teenage days, <clears throat> and um, um, also his sax writing. Um, but his wasn't the only sax writing that influenced me. If I think of Thad Jones' sax writing, <laughs> pardon me, I think of close voices, close voicings, and five voices. So, uh, and not only, because if I listen to earlier Thad Jones, then I will hear the baritone sax doubling the lead out. So, the more he wrote, the more he experimented with that and got away from that. Uh, and of course, you know, people like Duke Ellington are famous for 
taking the baritone sax, the fifth voice, and putting it way up in maybe the second or third place. And, and that creates a really beautiful, interesting kind of color. Uh, usually Thad, rather than bring it up here, would just make it the fifth voice. Um, and that's, you know, all rules are made to be broken. Thad, you can find examples of Thad's writing where he didn't do it that way. Um, but Thad had a huge influence on my uh, writing, on my saxophone writing, on my um, ensemble writing. You know, if I want to, if I want to write in the style of Thad Jones, um, or with his influence, I should say, then I'll, I will take into account what I just earlier talked about, about the, every, the ear always goes to the lead voice of every instrument section. Thad ran with that. So if he wanted a real beautiful ensemble where, the, where you were forced to hear it as a mass of sound that was moving um, lyrically, then he would, let's say, let's say the top voice um, might be a D natural. And that might give the trumpet the D for the melody. He might give the alto saxophone a B flat or even a C. You know, and then he might give the trombone the B flat underneath that. And now your ear could is a bit confused. It's hearing the lead trumpet play that note on top, but those other lead voices that it normally goes to are so close and could even clash with what the lead trumpet is doing that it becomes a mass of sound that then moves in a beautiful way. So, you know, the, the more you, uh, the, the curiouser you are, <laughs> the more you discover these kinds of things. But that, that influenced my saxophone writing, but not only, he, he influenced, influenced my ensemble writing. You know, and, and then conversely, what, the things that I transcribed to pe people like uh, Neil Hefty, you know, he's a really great example of making sure that in his, for instance, his shout courses, there are usually, usually a lot of clarity in his, in his melodies in the shout courses because he would use triple lead. Um, he would, the, the, the note that the lead trumpet player was playing was the same note that the lead trombone player was playing, was the same note that the lead alto player was playing. So it became really obvious where the ear needed to go in terms of that melodic sound. So yeah, Thad Jones, my hero. All right, thanks, John. Uh, we've got another question here about uh, what other arrangers inspire your big band writing? It's a long list. Um, <clears throat> Thad Jones we talked about. Um, Duke Ellington, big time. Um, also um, Quincy Jones. Uh, Oliver Nelson, Gerald Wilson, <laughs> um, uh, Gil Evans. Henry Mancini. Henry Mancini also, definitely. Um, I was, when I was 19 years old, I got to work with Henry Mancini and I was exposed to his, his music, his sounds. And then when I was at Indiana University studying Hank knew that I was going to go to study at IU, and he said, hey, when you go to Indiana, uh, call up this guy, and because uh, I get my touring or orchestra out of Bloomington, Indiana, where you're going to be, and uh, uh, you, can, you can do tours with me while, while you're going to school. And that's what I did for three years. Um, so Mancini, totally a big influence. I'd say that Mancini's influence was really reflected when I had... Uh, more of a chance to expand the ensemble and include French horns uh, and include other kinds of woodwinds. Um, then, then I really kind of lean, I automatically go to my Hank um, recordings and, and experiences. But that's, that's a short list of the people who, 
really uh, who I really listened a lot to. If you don't mind me asking, has Russ Garcia influenced you as well? Not a lot. I heard only, first of all, I bought his book. His was one of the first arranging, um, composing arranging books I got uh, when I was first starting out. Again, I didn't study. So I had to ask around, what, what book should I get? How do I learn how to do this? And the first thing that people mentioned was Russ Garcia. So, uh, and then of course, later on, I discovered his music um, and learned a lot. I can you learn, you learn from everybody, but um, so his was not an initial big influence on what I did, but, but his, his book really did help me. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Thanks, Taylor. And thanks, John. Yeah, thanks, um, we are at the five minute mark. So I just want to say uh, we will try our best to get through the rest of the questions here. Um, so we've got another one here from Taylor. Um, what are your thoughts on handwriting scores compared to how in music education, we now have software such as Finale and Sibelius? Should musicians still approach traditionally to writing scores by hand? Uh, my short answer is yes. And I also think that's why a lot of people don't study with me because I insist on it. Um, I, the, 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 we need to embrace the software. I, you know, I, I don't as a writer, but my, the people that copy my music do, and it's cool, it's important. We need to embrace that. But I find that the software has actually also damaged young writers because they didn't go through the, the ear development process that is, I believe, crucial to being a good writer. <clears throat> so for instance, if you go into a studio nowadays or whatever, any situation, uh, the, the, uh, the writers have already, quote, found the wrong notes. Instead of, and why, do they, why have they found the wrong notes? Because they enter the informa information in the software, and then they hit the space bar, and through some real chintzy sounds, they get a playback, and they can go, oh, that should be an F sharp, not an F natural, and they make the corrections and that sort of thing. Uh, that's robbing you of the joy of discovery. It's robbing you of the joy of growth because the people before that generation had to do like what my generation and you know older people had to do, which is you do your best, you get the parts done, you deliver to the rehearsal, the the ensemble plays your music, then you have to discover through hearing it, oh, wait, 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 what is that? Oh, there's a wrong note in there. What is that? Ah, I think it's third trombone. And if, if you can imagine uh, more and more of those experiences, the next thing you know, your ear is so strong that you don't have as much a problem discerning what's going on with the music. Also, um, people nowadays will hit the, the button and transpose their score by hitting the button. Uh, I wrote, when I first joined the Basie Band, um, I wrote a score, I didn't know what I was doing, I'd never done this stuff before. I wrote a C score, they played my music, it sounded like crap, I, I started making all kinds of little corrections and, and a couple of things happened. Number one, the guys in the band that didn't, that were really great writers said to me, what are you doing? I said, ah, it didn't sound good to me. I want to change this. And he said, don't do that. Just write another one. And the stuff you didn't like in the first one, leave it out of the second one. So that was one big lesson. The other one was, well, uh, your score, it's a C score. You always write a C score? I said, uh, uh, yeah. Why do you do that? I, I don't know. Don't do that, man. Write a transpose score. And I went, uh, duh, okay. Little did I know they were saving my life because fast forward to, to the future years. Now I'm at whatever, Capitol Studios. I've got a big orchestra there. I'm on the podium. My hands are up. A hand goes up in the orchestra. John, can you tell me what my note is at bar 37? I look and let's see, what is that? Uh, French horn. Okay. Uh, I look at read the better. You need to have an F sharp there. Great. Thanks, babe. You know, those are the skills that people are losing. And it's really a pity for them. 
Knowledge is freedom. The more you know, the more choices you can make. If you can't read a transpose score, if you can't write a transpose score, that means you're limited. And I promise him, Johnny Mandel, <clears throat> uh, I was reading one of his scores once, and I said to him, uh, this score is in C. And he said, yeah, what's wrong with that? And I said, nothing. I just wondered, do you always write C scores? He said, yeah, pretty much. And I said, uh, and he said, why don't you? And I said, well, I, I always transpose my scores. And he said, Johnny Mandel said, oh, do you know how to write a C score? And I said, sure. He said, then you can if you want to. It's the people who don't know how to transpose, write a transpose score that need to learn that skill. Then you have a choice. You can if you want to. So those are big help from Johnny Mandel. That's really? great. Thanks, John. Good. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. I know we're getting a little close on time, but we have just a couple more questions. So uh, I'm good. Um, I'm, I'm, I ain't going nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> You're always too fun, John. I love it. <laughs> you know me. If it ain't fun, I go home. <laughs> uh, we got a question here from Cody McVeigh, uh, who says, your chart for how insensitive for Diana Krall is amazing. Oh, Was there a particular you. inspiration or influence on that chart? And how did you arrive at it? Brilliant in its simplicity. Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> The older you get, I think, the, the more you embrace simplicity. Uh, I want simple, I don't want mediocre. <laughs> so, uh, and with that particular chart, um, with most of the things I write, I always think about the mood and I try to enhance and embrace the mood of the piece. And the second thing is that was a little bit of a an exercise in tension and release for me. So I, I just kind of combined those thoughts, simplicity, the mood, tension, and release. How can I create tension? You know, and there, when you write a, a vocal arrangement, I remember Bill Holman, uh, we were working on a, a joint project uh, recording for Natalie Cole, and um, I remember I had finished my charts and then Bill had his charts and we played, I was talking to Bill afterwards. And I said, man, you just really great charts that you wrote for Natalie. And he said, oh, thanks. And I said, and then he said, well, you know what it's like. It's kind of like taking candy from a baby. <laughs> and what he meant by that was when you write for a vocalist, you have so many givens. You're given the key, you're given the tempo, you're given the length, you know, you, you're, you already know that you can't step on the vocalist, you know, so you, you know how you drive, have to drive the ear. And when you have all those parameters, then the writing, frankly, goes a lot smoother. Somebody says, hey, I'd like for you to write a new piece for me. And, they, and I and I said, what do you want it to be? And they said, well, anything you want, boom. Now I'm like dead in the water. Oh God, <laughs> where do I start? So um, the same thing with that how insensitive thing. There was so much, you know, I had to think about Diana, uh, Diana Crawl. I had to think about her voice quality. I had to think about um, the, the, the mood of the piece, how I'm going to do tension. And then I also did a, a lot of dovetailing on that. That particular arrangement you know. so um, while one or two instruments are playing a note that's sustained then I might add another instrument playing that same note and that note that instrument takes over the note this one stops and they continue it then I add another instrument and then these two guys are those those two voices are going along then maybe I add a third and I eliminate the second so it was a lot of that kind of stuff um, but yeah, just trying to be as simple as possible. All right, thanks. Uh, we just got a few more, so I'll try to squeeze these questions in here. Sure. Uh, Katie Thoreau asks, what was the moment that made you say no more to direct amplification? 
<laughs> um, a couple of things. I remember um, I heard, uh, I think Thad Jones had already moved to Europe, so it was just the Mel Lewis band, but I heard them at the Vanguard. And I asked, I think Dennis Irwin was playing bass at that time. And I asked Dennis Irwin, I said, man, your bass sounds so good. I couldn't see the amplifier. What kind of amplifier or pickup are you using? And he said, no amplifier. He wasn't even using a mic and he was playing with, you know, the Mel Lewis big band. And you could hear everything he was doing in a homogenous way with the band. So that was one. Then soon after that, I think I heard Christian McBride play. And he was playing, and he was just killing it like he always does. And the sound was so beautiful. And I, after I said, man, you sound so great. And you're, I said, what, what kind of mic are you using? He said, oh, I'm just using an RE20. And, uh, and that's all he had, this, you know, Electro Voice RE20 microphone in front of his instrument. And he had that going through the house and through some little monitor that he had. Um, soon after that, I was playing a gig with Jeff Hamilton, coincidentally, in a small group, and my I was using the, I think it might have been the Polytone pickup, and my pickup just kept shorting out. It finally just kind of died and, and sputtered and all this stuff, and I just took it off, and I looked at Hamilton, and I said, that's it, I'm done, <laughs> no more. And from that point on, I just stopped using a pickup. Uh, which made it easier for me when I bowl. It made it easier for me when I wanted to get the, you know, because we bass players, we, we, you search forever to find an instrument that you like. You try different strings, you practice, you, you know, work on your bow stuff, you work on your pizzicato stuff, you do all this stuff, and then you go to the gig and you plug into the amplifier and you get a different animal. And it's like, what am I doing? So I want my sound. It's like some people will say, uh, you know, well, we, we get a good sound here. I don't want your sound. I want my sound. That's all. My sound louder. That's all. And the only way I can get my sound, that one here in the room, louder is with a microphone. Just like the, the vocalist. Just like the trumpet player. Just like all those other people. Don't mess with my sound. I just want it louder. That's all. And... Um, so that was when I, I don't remember what year it was, but that was the event that happened that made me say I'm done. I had to get used to it, you know. I, already, I had already gotten used to playing at a more acoustic volume in the bassy band because they would have these drastic dynamic changes where they speedo piano and I'd have my amplifier on six, like roaring through, and they never said anything to me, but I knew I was destroying the dynamics. So I would turn my amplifier not off, but really, really low. And then sure enough, Ray Brown, probably trumpet player, probably remembers, you know, the, uh, I remember Cup, trumpet player saying, hey, John, uh, can you turn your amplifier up? We don't hear you so good. And I would say, I would just like pluck an open D string over and over and I'd like fake it. I wouldn't really turn it up. How's that? Is that better? And you go, yeah, man, that's it. That's better. Thank you. You know, so little by little, they got more, they got used to a more, uh, a more acoustic volume. Um, but I learned, I was all that to say, uh, through that experience, I was already used to hearing myself in a more acoustic way so that when the band is really roaring, I don't especially hear every note that I play. Um, but if I were to stop playing, you would feel it. That's the way it is with, with, with the bass. So, uh, yeah, microphone, going to a microphone and accepting a, a lower volume from the bass was kind of an easier transition for me. That's great. That's great. Thanks, John. All right, we're going to take one final question. Um, and this is from Fred Marcusen. How do you put together such great performances with the Anita Berry's big band with only one rehearsal? <laughs> so that's a, a big band that is put together for the jazz crews. Jazz Cruise happens every year um, in the dead of winter, but hey, you're in the Caribbean, so who cares? 
<laughs> but it's uh, it's uh, usually in February or January, February, into January or, begin, or beginning or mid-February. And um, it's a group of amazing players. Uh, when you have a certain level of playing, it makes it a lot less work to have to um, pull it together, explain what needs to be done. Uh, it also requires a certain kind of homework for me. I've got to make sure that I already know what I'm going to rehearse and how I'm going to rehearse it. I already have to know, oh, in this particular song, there's a sax soli. I need to reserve room time in the rehearsal so we get to, to play that a second time. I already know, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of, of prep work that I have to do to go into the rehearsal because they only give you a couple of hours to rehearse for the whole show and it's a long show. Um, and you know, it's it, when you're working with professionals at that level, your job is a lot easier, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, thanks, John. Um, well, I, I know we're a little over time here and I just wanted to thank you so much um, for we're going over a little bit, but also just for being here with us. It's always so much fun. I love speaking with you. It's always such a pleasure. Um, and thank, thank you everyone here who who was able to join us. We're so glad to have you. Yeah, I know you. I said oh, um, that was the final question, but I have one for you. <laughs> hey, I'm, a deal's I'm, a deal, baby. <laughs> just kidding. Go ahead. I am just dying to know, like with that massive insane library behind you what are you listening to lately ha i'm i'm listening to uh some cds that i haven't got around around to listening to um i'm also listening to um some of the younger players that are out there that are embracing this music oh, uh, so you know whether it's a ben wendell or uh, Ben Wendell, or Ambrose Kumasira, or my son Gerald. Um, trying to just listen to all that stuff. And, and then every now and then, I, I'll just say, you know, I feel like some, whatever it is, Duke, 70th birthday, or, you know, yeah. so I, I, it's a, or I might just put on some Jeremy Lubbock. I'm a huge fan of his. And uh, I might be blasting some, um, yeah, some bassy, some, it's all of it. I love yeah. it. Love yeah. it. Well, that's so, one great that's thing summer. about, you know, this time we're in, we actually get to, you know, enjoy being at home and, and make the best of it and listen to this great music that sometimes life gets so busy and it's good. Take advantage of it. Man. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I, it's, I have less time than I, I thought I would because I'm also, I cook for the family. I love to cook. So I'm the chef. Oh. I have to cook. I'm cooking now for four people. My wife and I, my daughter and her husband have a an eighth month old, an eight month old uh, grandbaby for me, <clears throat> a granddaughter. So that's really cool. Oh, but wow. I cook every day, and uh, that's fun. So I don't have as much time because I'm always figuring out menus that aren't boring, and you know, researching and trying different things. But that's great. That's great. I, I love cooking as well. And I, I'm just cooking for one here, but uh, it's been fun experimenting. So it's very cool. Because I know you I love know. to experiment with music. I can just imagine how you're on the kitchen. That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Well, again, thank you so much, John. Everyone, well, here. My pleasure. Thank you. I appreciate everybody coming in and joining me. I really appreciate you all. Yeah. And uh, Local 47, you know, we're we've been we've been doing these about once a month and we are really just hoping to continue it and yeah john again thank you so much for being part of this your time is so valuable and your insights are just it's always just so good to hear from you so thank you I hope all right to see you soon and right. stay safe care. lots of love to everybody make sure you vote yes vote everyone <laughs> everyone stay safe all right see you all soon bye